What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of the sit down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of today's very interesting discussion in the comment section below. If you enjoy this interview and all the other content I do, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss a sit down video. If you listen to us currently on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, welcome in. I hope you enjoy the show as well. Make sure you leave us a five-star rating and a detailed review. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into what we do best on this channel, interview people. And since the start of this channel, nearly three years ago, we have engineered multiple individuals from the life of organized crime to come on that we've never heard before. People like Dominic Sicali, Howard Santos. We've spoken to people like Judge John Gleason, all sorts of people for the first time. Let's just be honest, we're groundbreakers on this channel, bringing you new people from the world of the mafia. Today, we are going to break the silence of one person who you may have seen, you may have heard from, but you maybe don't know the whole story. Let's introduce him. He is somewhere in America currently, and it is Hector Jr. Pagan. Jr., you are really, in my estimation, one of the most interesting people ever associated with American organized crime. This is really a whirlwind because you are someone who we saw on television, right? You were on a TV show, Mob Wives. You've lived a fascinating life. You've done time in prison throughout your life. You were connected with all sorts of high profile people. And you literally have disappeared for the last six or seven years. My first question is, how are you? This went through a long period of time, you and I. I've talked to you back and forth for a while. We're finally making this happen. How you doing? I'm doing good at this point. I am. Um, you know, uh, I was thinking about, you know, why I was doing this and, uh, you know, and what's my reasoning and stuff like that. And uh, I pretty much, you know, seen a lot of different uh, of these podcasts and I've seen guys throw all these war stories and all these other type of stuff. And that's not what I'm really looking to do with the situation. Um, I'd like to give a little background of my history and uh, what intrigued me to get involved in this certain lifestyle and where it brought me to and where I wound up with it. So um, also to, uh, to show the younger generation that may think this is all uh, glamorous and stuff like that. Um, that is not, it's not, it's anything but that. Uh, so with that, um, I'll just follow your lead. Uh, yep. I'll answer all your questions, whatever you need to know. Um, I'm here for you. I think one thing I want to say right at the beginning is we obviously don't have hours on end to sit here in one discussion and talk about your entire life. I'm hoping over the next course of a long period of time, we can hear more about your story, right? Because I've been asked about people like you. I've been asked about your situation. Um, I find you, as I said, very interesting. So we're going to go through a little bit. But we can't obviously sit there forever, but we hope down the road, maybe you'll tell us more. I want to start out. This is our first time speaking to you. This might be some people's first time of ever hearing about you. I guess I'll just start with where you grew up. What was your life like as a child? And I think the question that a lot of people have, what's your nationality, Junior? Okay, um, I'm Italian and Corsican. Um, my grandfather was from Corsica, and um, my mother uh, married my stepfather, which was Puerto Rican, named Roberto Sanchez. So growing up in Bensonhurst, as you know, in back, back in those days, it was a very racial time. So um, I was labeled as Puerto Rican. I don't really care what people want to label me as. I'm a man, I'm a man, I'm a man. You know what I mean? So it doesn't make a difference to me. So my nationality is Italian and Corsican. But you were raised by someone who was Puerto Rican, right? Yes, my stepfather. Well, I could say he raised me, uh, but he didn't. But he was my, um, he, was he, was, a he was the man in my life, yes. Sure. Okay, very good. And from what I know, what you've told me, you quickly got into boxing, which turned kind of, you had some success with that, but you got into criminality pretty early, didn't you, in Brooklyn? Yes. Uh, what happened was um, when I was a child, my uh, 
my mom and my stepfather were uh, uh, they were into the drug scene and um, they couldn't take care of me. So I went from stayed home and to stayed home and stuff like that. And that, at the age of six, I was they were able to grab me and they pulled me and they brought me to Puerto Rico, which was his family was from. And it was the worst part of Puerto Rico you could possibly be in. I didn't know any English. I learned Spanish there. Um, fought every day, this, that, whatever. Um, it got so dangerous that my stepfather brought me to a place called Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, which is prominently a black neighborhood, um, which was, like I said, was very racial back then. And from there on, I got into the life of crime but not in the Italian world, in the black world. From then, um, the story goes long. So, you know, I'll just cut it to, uh, to, to work, you know. What kind of, let me ask you, what, what kind of things are you doing back then? Uh, with, with, were you ripping and running? What, what were you doing exactly? Okay. So you, you got to figure I was like, uh, I was about 10 years old living in Bedford Stuyvesant. Um, I did a, uh, 60 days in uh, Spofford because I was getting jumped every day and I had I did a slashing. Um, I met a kid, Leroy, black kid there. His uncle was a pimp. My uh, stepfather went to prison for a long time. We had no food, no heat, no nothing. I was uh, the one that was um, providing for my mother and my little sister. His uncle was a pimp and gave us a score. So as far as your question is, what was I doing? He gave us a score to rob a collectible coin store, and we did that. That was my first uh, armed robbery, and I came out with a good lick. And from then, I moved to Be Be uh, Bensonhurst, which is the first day where I met Joe Messina at the age of 13 years old. Wow, 13. So what year were you born, Junior? In 65. So you met Joe Messina late 70s right right and at that time joey messino was just kind of a young hijacker if you will right he's yeah he was he, he might have been a soldier i don't even know uh at that point you know i don't know you know i was young i didn't understand the ins and outs and the uh the positions and all that stuff at that point how do you how do you meet him like how does that go down okay so here's what happens um when i got there i had some money from the score i did I furnished an apartment for my mother and my sister. I paid the rent for six months. Um, there was a cafe across the street. Joe Messina had a club on 17th Avenue. It was a real, it was a Gambino club, but Joe Messina was there all the time. And he's seen me all the time out there. And this uh, cafe guy says, hey, Junior, I, um, I heard, you know, you do. He heard some things I've done on the street, little things. He goes, you want to make some money? I says, yeah. He says, this is a guy named Papuzzo. He has a Coke dealer. And if you go into his apartment uh, in a macaroni box, you'll find $10,000. Bring the money back to me and I'll split the money with you. So I said, fine. In passing, I see Joe every day. We talked every day. He liked me. I liked him. Um, so when I, I did the robbery, I brought the money back to Salvino and he's counting the money and he gave me $200. I counted the money before I brought it there. It was $10,000. Joe Messina said to me, what's the matter, Junior? I says, no, Salvino told me to do a robbery. He says he's going to split the money with me. And um, he gave me 200 out of $10,000 and we were supposed to split it down the middle. So he grabbed me by the arm. He brought me in there and he smacked Salvino in the face. And he says, instead of sending this kid to school, you want to have him doing robberies? He goes, give me that money. He took the money. He says, come with me to the club. He brought me to the club. He says, Junior, he goes, I'm not giving you this whole $10,000. You're too young to have it. But anytime you need money, you come into the club. If you need a couple of hundred dollars, I'll give it to you. You sign your name. And the money, as it goes, it goes. You know what I mean? So with that, I had a long-term relationship with him because I already had my own money from my last score. So, uh Fast forward, that led us into years of getting to know each other. Fast forward, I wind up in Otisville with Joe Messina after that. And that's how we became much closer than that. So I want to ask you about that, but I want to just quickly ask you about your childhood. You you kind of just told us a story, and I think a lot of people will say to themselves, he was 13. How is he doing these sort of things? 
But you quickly became a man, from what I understand. You, as you said, were in Spofford, which Spofford has a notorious reputation in New York City. It's no longer open, but it was a, a home for juveniles. And it was a very bad place, as you know. Um, but you were forced quickly to kind of become a man. So the fact you were a teenager didn't mean a whole lot because you had to be a man, right? Yes. And uh, like I said, I met this guy, Leroy, in Spofford, and I really caught a really bad beating in there. But I fought, but I lost really bad. And Leroy is the guy that had the uncle with the score. And he was a boxer. And he brought me to bed Boxing Club, and we started boxing. And it happens to be I was talented at boxing. And I wasn't afraid to fight. So it was uh, – that led from that to that. And, uh, you know, guys could go to prison – and they think they're tough guys because on the streets they have guns, they have people behind them, and everybody's already intimidated by them before they get to meet them. But when you go to prison and you don't have your gun or your people behind you, that shows who you really are. Right. So that's where you're. Yeah. That's where you. 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 You're. Uh, that's what defines you as a man. You had to find out who you really were very early, right? So that's that you kind of became a man. I, I get it. So you mentioned you, you went to federal prison, right? You were pretty young, right? You were in your late teens, early 20s, right? Yes. Why'd you go to prison? Um, interstate transportation of uh, stolen property. Um, so uh, I was shipping guns across the state line, and um, I got I got arrested. I did five years on that. And um, that's where I wind up. Uh, I went to Lewisburg. There was a Lewisburg riot. They sent me back to – Otisville, which where I met Joe Messina, Johnny Brody. I mean, every gangster, Joe Rustel, uh, Rusty Rustel, every gangster you want to meet at that age, you met them. And I became close with everyone. I'm not to say that I'm the best guy in the world, but most people do like me because I'm a fair, I'm a fair person as far as if I'm if I'm your friend. Um, and uh, we built a lot of lot of relationships like that. So. So you do about five years. When do you get out? Do you remember the, the, what year? Yeah, I got out uh, in 2000, uh, uh, um, 1992. Sorry. Yeah, so early 90s. That makes yeah. sense. Right. So one. So you're you're much older than – I mean, in the streets, you're much older than you actually are. You, you, again, had to grow up quick. You know all these people in the life. You're from Bensonhurst. You've lived there for years. I guess tell me kind of the first – you first started getting into organized crime. You start messing around with, with mobsters. Because at one point, you were messing around with a crew in, in Manhattan, right? Yeah. yeah. Tell me well, about that. Well, um, I was messing around with a crew in Manhattan. We were just doing uh, – it was like uh, half bloods. It was a mixture of kids that did uh, strong arm robberies. And um, – they had connections. That's where little Johnny Brody was friends with them. And we got all mixed up together and, and all that other stuff. Um, in Otisville, uh, you know, um, I was with Johnny Brody. Um, there was a guy named uh, Vinny DiMartino. And uh, there was a situation in there. and Colombo guy. Yes. And... I had a, a fight in the mess hall and I hurt the guy pretty bad in the mess hall. And um, Vinny DiMartino wanted me to turn myself in because the guy had a lot of damage done to him. And Joe Messina says, you ain't turning yourself into nobody. He goes, anybody wants to hear about what happened? He goes, you tell them to come see me on the streets. And he told Johnny Brody that I'm with him from now on. And then Joe made me his Sally. And that's how my relationship with Joe was forever like you could you could be an associate you could be a soldier you couldn't sit down with joe in his restaurant i could sit down with joe anytime i wanted why do you think joe messino took a liking to you because he had you know, he had kids like he had young other people around him why do you think why do you think he took a liking to you i think it's because i i was a team player i i put myself on the front lines at all times i was a gentleman uh i'm a rational person but I also could do very bad things that intrigued him because he's like, you could never tell by your personality what type of person you really have deep down inside of you. Right. You know, so I guess that, you know. Um, he saw something in you in that. Yeah, in that way. regard, yes. 
Because a lot of people, when they hear your name, they think of TG. They think of some of the people you met later in life. But a lot, a lot of people know you actually met Joe Messino many years before that. But you mentioned a guy, Johnny Brody, right? Johnny Brody was this guy, John Sorrentino. He's from Manhattan, the KZ uh, made guy, was in Charlie Beck's crew. One thing that crew is, crew is known for was the drug trade. Were you, were, you, were you moving around in that world too? I never dealt in drugs. I, I was, a, I was a, uh, a score guy, so I would rob drug dealers. I never dealt in drugs. Uh, I can say one thing. Johnny Brody's a great person, uh, and so was his whole family. And uh, whatever they did on this, what they did, I don't know, because I never really got involved in that type of stuff with them. You know, so uh, we were more like a family. Uh, at first I was with him. Then we became family. Like, you know what I mean? So right. it was a whole different new relationship with them guys. Okay. So that's early 90s. You're, you're kind of under the flag of, of Joe. Um, look, Junior, I got to ask. I mean, sure. yes. one thing we know you for is you would eventually meet Rene Graziano. Right. When did that happen? Okay. Okay. Uh, when I was telling you I was getting out in 92, mm -hmm. um, my mom died from HIV. Uh, wow, really? Sorry yes. to hear that. And my stepfather, the Puerto Rican dude. Wow. And I was getting out, and my friend sent a picture of me and him to his girlfriend. And Renee was her girlfriend, and she wanted to get to know me. Mm -hmm. So I never met Anthony Graziano. I seen him in front of Joe Messina's, the club that Joe Messina hung out in front of. And... Um, and she uh, wanted to get together. She gave me her address. I picked her up once I got out. It was only a few months after that. He opens the door. He says, what are you doing here? He recognized me. I said, sir, I'm here to pick up Rene uh, Graziani. He goes, that's, that's my effing daughter. And he threw a couple of threats in there on me and stuff like that. And I smirked at him because I could see I'm not trying to downgrade him. But as I got to know him, I could say I, 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 could say I did at that point just by looking in his eyes, you know, like in prison, you get to see who people are just by looking in their faces and the first few sentences that they say. Um, he threatened me and whatever. And uh, then he gets Joe Messina. What do you think about this guy dating my daughter? He goes, I will let him date all three of my daughters at once. That's wow. what a great guy he is. Um, okay. So you, you got kind of the nod from them. And so you're saying you initially felt when you saw TG, you – you kind of knew, not weak, but you knew he was not. Well, well, you know what? Um, I came from the Lewisburg riots. I came from the worst of the worst in the right. 80s. This That's guy right. never did a friggin' reform school bid. You know what I mean? He doesn't. He didn't even know what the streets, the life was about. Nothing like that. He was in so a You viewed school. yourself as kind of the ultimate gladiator school guy who – has seen it all. You've been through it all. And right. no one is. okay. Right. And, and there was no reason for you to speak to me that way because to me, I, I, I laughed at him when he did that. Do you think maybe he just viewed you as someone he didn't want his daughter around you? And you can't, you can't knock him for no, that. No, no, right? that was, that was his personality. It was intimidation. Okay. There was a lot of barking going on. So it's, what do you want? You know, what are you here? For? Okay. I yeah, it, it, was kind of, of, it was a lot of barking and intimidation. Um, I'm, I'm the type of guy, like, if you speak to me with respect, we'll get a lot further than if you threaten me. Makes sense. I think that's pretty level-headed. That's most people's thoughts on things. Right. Okay. Um, so you, yeah. you meet Renee, you, you, you hang out, you date, um, you would eventually marry her. Um, right. we know from the show that you, you obviously had a long relationship. You would eventually have kids with her, a son. son um, yes. but, but. During your time in the street, I kind of want to get to know what you did, right? You 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 were hanging around like PJ Pisciotti, right? You were hanging yeah. around different people. What kind of things were you doing for the Bonanno crime family? I'm a score guy. Other than that, you were just ripping and running. That was it. No bookmaking. I'm a score guy. Yeah, I did. I, I did. Book, I had a Rico case with bookmaking. I those those little crimes that you're talking about. I just forgot about them. But my main source of income were strong arm robberies. Like if there was a big load of weed coming in or uh, a big shipment of this or that, you know, we would uh, we would have it set up to where we were going to take it from you. So take me through that. So you get a phone call, right? And they say, hey, I got a, I got a line on marijuana. Yeah. 
Then what? So we do our homework. We find out um, if these guys have any connections, say they're Albanians, say they belong to this crew, that crew, this, whatever. We do our homework, and we realize that either they're suckers, which means that there ain't nobody, or they belong to somebody, which means we might just let it go or take a shot and then return the money if something comes up out of it. Okay. And that's that's how it goes. Yeah. So – you're running in there, but you're not running in cold cock. You're not running in with the thought of, we just don't care. We're Cowboys. We're going to do what we want. We're going to sit on this place no, a little we, bit. No, we play by the rules. Yeah. So what would be the thought of, let's say you did rob someone connected. Um, the, the the thought was you would just give it back. You didn't worry about they were going to whack us or get rid of us or something. No, that's where, that's where the po- politics comes in. So now if I rob somebody from another uh, family and, uh, they went around spreading word that their load got robbed and this, that, whatever. And it came down to the, I had some big loads of weed or whatever the frigate is, a load of guns, whatever. It comes down. It's a small world. And then you say to yourself, you know, listen, go talk to them. Tell them I got what I got. They want to give me a little something. We'll return whatever. And they'll always the favor down the road. But you felt like due to the fact that you had people behind you, you knew powerful people, you just thought, well, it's all right. If I get caught, we'll just have to give some back. It's not a big deal. Exactly. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't going to be uh, um, like, like a death sentence type thing unless it was somebody that was just, you know, cold cocked and wild and shit like that. But that normally doesn't happen like that. When, how often were you doing these? Were you doing them weekly? How much money are you making? Are you doing well with this financially? Um, well, the last robbery I did was, as you know, about the, the James Donovan one. Well, I'm talking about like early, like when you started. Yeah, early. yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. We had a stripper and we had a strip club. We used to tell the girls, look at their watches, look at their cars, uh, let them do coke, let them tell you all their bullshit. And see what they got. So we had, I'll give you a for instance. We got one guy. He says, listen, I'm getting a load of weed in. And I would like to take you girls to Hawaii. I'll let you know when it's coming in. This, that, whatever. The girl came to me. She said, Junior, this guy's getting thing in. A load of weed in. I says, okay. Let me know when it's coming in. And we'll give you a piece. Beeper goes off. Weed's there. UPS outfits go on. Tie the guy up. All right. It's uh uh, 200 pounds of purple haze at 300,000, uh, 3,000 a pound plus six kilos of cocaine. So we give the girl $10,000. We made 600 grand or more. You know what I mean? Things like that. So when you say we, how many people are doing this? You and someone else? Oh, that, was just, that was just two of us. Yeah. Okay. And now are you, are, what, what's the thought of, are you, how much are you kicking up? Who are you kicking up to? Are you kicking up to anybody? Oh yeah, I kicked up. I kicked up, of course. You know, um, there's a war chest. You have to put your money in there because if you need to borrow money to do something else, you borrow from the war chest. Uh, they lend it to you. You put it back, and then you give ten percent if if it's the business succeeds. Um, so the money goes into a circle, and everybody uses it. It belongs to everyone. So my, I would kick up say on the six hundred thousand. I would give. I gave my. Uh, my ex father in law, I gave him twenty five grand. You know what I mean? So, okay. so by this point, once you start running around with Renee, you eventually marry her. Do you immediately fall into the flag of him? Does yes. Jody say, okay, he's your guy now. Take care of him. Yes, yes. But I was always able to because if he was irrational with me, because um, he knew I wasn't afraid of him, and he felt like he had no control over me, which I wasn't trying to disrespect him in any way. It's just that uh, we had a uh, a love hate relationship, and I I have to say I love the guy. He was a great hearted person, but if I needed to, I would just call Joe and say, Joe, this guy's uh, he's off his rocker right now. You better straighten this shit out because I don't want no not, you know no situations come between me and him. You know what I mean? Got Things you. like that. How many people TG did he have under him? A lot. There were a lot of people under him. Uh. Yeah, uh, I mean it's it's hard to say because they were all scrubs. You know what I mean? His whole crew was a bunch of scrubs. Like meaning they weren't good earners and stuff, or they they were just a bunch of pussies, man. 
Hmm. That's what got me disgusted, you know, at the end. You know, that's why I, I said, fuck this shit. These guys are fucking, these guys ain't shit. So it seems like throughout your whole life, you never felt like people were as tough as you. Now, I here's what I'll say, and here's where I'll, I think people will probably watch this and say, oh, this guy thinks he's the toughest guy. I will tell you straight up. I talked to multiple people about you, people that knew you, okay, guys that, one of which is still around today. And he said, I hate that guy's guts, but he was a tough motherfucker and nobody fucked with him. I heard people were very scared of you in the street, made guys, guys that were very high up, people that have been called acting boss, things like that. Do you think that was the issue in your life that maybe you just, maybe you were too crazy for that world? No, no, no. I wasn't crazy. I was rational, but I, I, I just didn't feel like you were more important than I was. Like if somebody said to you, this is your position, you're above him, I don't recognize that. I recognize you as if you're an older man than me and I show you respect as my elder. But if you can't get the phone in prison, then you know, we got nothing, we got nothing to talk about. Yeah, you know what I mean? okay, I get what you're saying. You don't yeah. you don't respect us guys that are soft. Right. You know? Makes sense. You know, I'm I'm not the toughest guy in the world. I mean, I, I'm I'm not afraid to fight. I've been boxing, of course. If you box, you're not afraid to fight. Um, I'm capable of doing certain things, which you already know. Um, but I'm not the toughest guy in the world. I could turn the corner one day and somebody could just take me out. Every yeah. no, nobody's nobody's that tough. You know what I mean? Nobody's I, immortal, right? And I'm not saying that I am. I'm just saying that you know. People were in, in that position in life that shouldn't have been there from the day when I was younger and I seen all the real tough guys. It got me so disgusted. Like, who am I standing here with? Like, I don't even belong here anymore. Right. I understand. So you're making a bunch of money, you know, strong arm robberies. You're, you're kicking up to the people you need to kick up to. Like I said, are you doing these Weekly? How often are you doing stuff like this? Well, you you, you can't say weekly. You, you, you um that's your that's your homework. You go around, you find out. You got all sorts of uh, outs. You find out who's got this, who's got that. People come to you. Your reputation grows. People come to you. Hey June, I got a score here. I got a score there. Is it worth it? What's the risk? You know what I mean? How much is it? If I get caught, how much time will I do? You weigh it out. You do it. See, like, uh, say you're a pot dealer. People will come to you and they'll automatically say he gets, he buys the best, he, he sells the best weed. He'll buy the best, give you the best prices. With me, the score guy, oh, he's a great score guy. He'll get it done in two seconds. There's no problem. You know what I mean? So your gotcha. reputation precedes you and people come to you with that. And that's what your, um, your title becomes. Obviously, you, you seem like you have a lot of respect for like someone like Joe Messino. Seems like you have a little respect at times for someone like a TG. Obviously, you're a guy who was known to do what he had to do. I'll ask you this. Was there a guy in that life that you remember that you were just, they were just a mean motherfucker. They were just, they weren't built like all the others. Do you know, did you meet anybody like that? Uh, that I knew that were way above the average. That's what you're yeah. asking me? Yeah. I had a score partner. His name was Scotty Body Count. He was a Jewish kid. He got killed. Um, he was a little too wild. Then you got guys like Tommy Karate. You know, um, you met Tommy Karate. I, I've met Tommy Karate. We didn't know each other like that. I was younger. It was a whole different generation. But there, are, there was some. You know, like growing up, the the, the Karini brothers. You know, my friend Frankie Smith was a tough yeah. guy. Sure. You know what I mean? You know, so Gaspa, I grew my little circle of guys. They were all the same type of people. So, like, if you want to say, um, how do you consider that normal? Because that's what the norm was. So you felt like it was normal. Right. right? Yeah. We, we heard Junior Gotti say that. Junior Gotti made a point at one point that everybody in Howard Beach, they, they were all bookmakers or or loan show everybody did it and, and everybody thought it was normal because everybody did it so you felt like what you were doing was normal i mean you even made a, a point early in this interview where you said i asked you if you did bookmaking you said that was just little shit we didn't even like like yeah. most people would say well that's illegal right 
But do yeah. you? That's just a little thing. Like you don't you don't care about doing a year for bookmaking, do you? No, no. Those those are the those are little side things that you made money with. It's like little extra pocket money. So in the two thousands, obviously you had your marriage you had a son um did that change you at all having a kid did that change your ways in any way did you ever think like maybe i should get out of this at some point well um jeff you know when you get involved at, at such a young age you do uh, something serious i want to get into that right um and they have that on you and you have that on them you're stuck mm -hmm. you understand yeah you understand what i'm saying yeah okay so um it changed me. Why would I want to have more children knowing that every time I got out of prison, I was going to get handed a load of work to do and see how much time could I last on the street before I go back to prison? Why would I want to be a selfish father in that way? So I never had more than one child, you know, as far as, you know, AJ is concerned, you know. Um, but So you're saying that in a way that, that life, you had a son, but you didn't want any more because you knew it. Really, at one point, you were going to probably go to prison again. You didn't want to subject any more children to that. I guess I'm asking, so you kind of just assumed this was going to be your life. You were going to go back and forth. But this is the life you chose, and this is how it's going to work. Right. Okay. Exactly. Now, obviously, you're not fully Italian, so there was right. never a thought of. I mean, did it, was that something you had ever dreamed of? Did you ever want to be a mobster? Is that what you wanted ever? Listen. I, I sat down with captains. I sat down with underbosses. I sat down with everybody. I didn't need a title like, see, like John John Jr., you say half Jewish, you know what I mean? He needed that title. I didn't need that. I didn't care about that. If it was me and you, I had any anybody would talk to me. You know what I mean? So – like I said, to me, uh, th those titles, things, uh, and people saying you're you're more important than the next guy. I go by the respect that you hold, and and that you're elder, you're my elder, and that's it. I don't care. I'm not power struck. I don't need to show you who I am. I'm secure with myself, and that's that's how I that's how I ride. So, when when you first heard about the idea for the show mob wives what, what was your first thought to that well, first of all i was already going to cooperate so i said let me make a few dollars and get the fuck out of here <laughs> so what did you decide i guess you know obviously you know that's obviously the the, the climax if you will of, of your life in that world when do you decide to do that what year was that why did you do it okay did you just want out okay so what happened was i was introduced to these two guys that i went on the robbery with um, there was three guys, actually. One guy died of a heroin overdose. Another guy, uh, Richie, um, Richie he was, right. yeah, he's the one that had the score. I pulled lead on the score because I didn't know these guys. It was an easy score. And, um, the guy wouldn't cooperate with me. So I shot him in the leg. I just didn't have time to go back and forth with him. So, um, we got the money. It was like 450 grand. We left 150,000 in the trunk. They said it was a botched score, but we didn't have time to get the balance of the money. We thought 450 is all that what that that it was. Um, I was away. I get called down saying that these this guy Richie's going around telling people how I'm crazy. I shot this guy in the middle of the street. The feds are looking for me. This that whatever, and. And um, they wanted to speak to me. So now I had Joe Messina obviously was, um, like I said, we were close. So I don't know what he did for me that he saved me, but they were going to open up something that was already being sealed if I didn't cooperate. As a, And these guys were looking at Richie. I don't know about uh, Ronnie. Richie was going to cooperate against me. And then we're going to open up that. So, and then my father-in-law was going to get uh, like 22 years for ordering two murder conspiracies um, underneath that sealed indictment. And I'm not sure if it's going to open up or if it's, it's even exists anymore. But um, I says, you know what? My whole top tier, Joe Messina, everybody flipped. Everybody's gone. I have nobody left. Um, it's just like, like I said to you, 
what am I doing here? Right. I'm not, I'm, listen, there's no excuse for ratting. You want to go into that life, you go out that way. You die right. in prison or you die but get shot in the head. I got shot in the head. You know what I mean? So it's, it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not making any excuses. But my father-in-law really got hurt a lot worse than he did, which he only wanted to do in a year instead of 22 years. Um, and... You know, I, I decided I want to give myself one more chance at life. And these guys weren't for me anymore. Uh, say what you want with that. You know what I mean? Make it as an excuse. I now, don't know. Let me ask you, before before I just kind of clarify the situation you're talking about in 2010, I want to go back to Joey Messino cooperating. Okay, right? He gets taken off the street in 2003, eventually flips. Do you remember the first time you heard about him flipping? What did you think about that when you first heard it? Uh, I was devastated. I was in prison. Could you believe it? Uh, no. Just like nobody could believe I did. You know? I, I couldn't believe it. Um, and it fucked me all up. But you know what? You know, when we were kids walking around the track one day, uh, he says, you know, remember when your grandmother gives you a bowl of soup? She says, eat around the edges because the scent is really hot. He goes, that's what you do with your guys. You keep the guys that can take the heat, you put them in the middle. The guy, the weaklings, you put them around the end. He put all the fucking weaklings in the center, and they all ratted on him. Yeah. Right. And that's oh, what happened. Oh, yeah. Everything sure. came crumbling down from top to bottom. No bananas left. Nobody's there. Everybody's dead in jail. It's over. You know, so – um. So you felt like by the end of like the 2000s, early 2010, that life was pretty much ending for you, but you're still out there in the streets. And in 2010, what you were referring to is you and two, three other individuals, you go to this check cashing store, right? No, it, it, he was just carrying the cash in the car. Okay, there you go. Yeah. And he was, there was rumor that he was connected, I think at some point. Yeah, too. he was. He was a little crazy guy. Right. And Richie was one, is the guy that set the score up. But yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, this guy, James Donovan, one thing yeah. leads to another, he dies. Um, but you had said you had kind of decided before that you were looking to get out of that world. So they call you down, one thing leads to another, and they say, okay, we got this body on you. Yeah. Is that when you, is that when you say, all right, I'm in? That's what I said. I'm, I'm done. I'm finished. I'm leaving. Now, remember, as we know, no one, in, obviously no one knew this, you were then told to wear a wire. You wore right. a wire for how long? For how long? Yeah. Well, just a few days. Wasn't long. Okay. No, they just wanted something uh, with my father-in-law. You know what I mean? Talking about those things. But he had nothing to do with it. So, uh, you know, he got that little 10-month bid, and that was it. People think, like, I buried my father-in-law. I didn't. Yeah, one one thing I've noticed you, you, you aren't really willing to admit is that you did wear a wire around your own father-in-law. Did you – don't you find that to be a little – He's the one guy really in your life that outside of Messino, maybe if was a father figure to you. Yeah. Do you feel like maybe that's one person off limits? Not if you look at it, not if you're saving him. So you felt like you were doing him a service by exactly. kind of getting him out from. Exactly. Hmm. Exactly. Do you and find it interesting that yeah. let's just say the people that you used to be around, for instance, your ex-wife, she doesn't see it that way. No, because uh, he was supposed to explain it to her, but he got Alzheimer's. I don't care what she thinks, but yeah. um, but, but you know that's my son's mother. I yeah, wish I wish we could be um, amicable and you know, you know, get along and stuff like that. Because I always protected her, even though we weren't together. Even when you know her father was away, whatever the case. But she um. I, I can't talk bad about it, but she's got she's got a little bit of a, a screw loose here and there. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't ask you to. I, I get yeah, it. yeah. So you know, um, she doesn't even know what happened. Most of the people don't know what happened. So you know, I'm comfortable. I'm not comfortable that I that I cooperated. I'm not. Don't get me wrong. I'm comfortable where I am today. I'm going to live the rest of my life, and I'm never going back to jail. This whole situation that I'm in right now has nothing to do with the streets. It was just something that the stars lined up and fucked me in my ass. There's Hold on. We'll get, we'll get to that at the end. But I want to. I, I just want to kind of put a bow on this particular story. So you, how long are you facing? Are you facing life? What are you facing? Right now? 
No, with your your the case you cooperated in. Oh my God! Yeah, like four life sentences. Right. So you had more than one body on you. They were trying to put a couple of them on you. Yeah. So you ultimately cooperate. You testify against a lot of people, right? Do, do you remember who in particular? No, you I testified against two. The two guys that I just did the score with. The okay. other guys copped out to like fucking ten months, eight months, seven months. It right. was nothing. Right. I know they did try to connect you to like Vinny TV and guys like that. Yeah. 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 He went, he got eight months. Gotcha. So you ultimately, though, are hit pretty hard. You got 11 years in your case. Judge Gleason was your judge, wasn't he? Right. And we had him on this show. He's a nice guy to me, but yeah. I'm sure you look a little differently at him. No, he um, wasn't bad. Okay. So, but you thought that was a little excessive, I'm sure, right? You. No, I, 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 my deal was take a 15 year hit. If Fondo gets out in a certain amount of time and you move the fuck on. So I, I was, I was willing to take the 15 years to help my father in law get, have another shot at life. Which he ultimately would. He got out. He, he did. Got he, got, he got, he did eight months. So yeah, he, he died in 2019. You were in prison at the time. How'd you feel when you heard that news? I was sad. I was sad. He, he was uh, he was a good guy, you know. He had his little things just like everybody else does. But, you know, I was sad. But, you know what? Um, I'm also sad that my mom died, you know. I'm sad about a lot of people dying. It's just part of life, right? Right, exactly. I want to ask you, um, obviously, when you cooperate, and we've ta I've talked to many people that have cooperated on this channel, um, you obviously don't go to the same prison a lot of the time. You're not in the same, you're not in like a wing with people you would have cooperated against. They don't do that. You were in prison at one point with Sammy Gravano, right? Yeah, I, I stepped out of the program. I went to I went I went to the general population. You did. So you yeah. weren't you weren't in any special unit, nothing like that? At the beginning, and then I jumped out of it and I said, I'm not staying here. I'm going to go to the regular population. You weren't worried about that? Um I guess for a minute, yeah. But you, but you thought I'll, I'll be fine, right? Uh, I thought so, yeah. And I guess I was right, yeah. Who were you around in those those lockups? Uh, the Aryan Brotherhoods, shit like that. You know. You want to get into any of that? Nah, there's nothing really to get into. I was just, you know, those were my car. Like I hung out with the. There's no New York guys there, so they pulled me in. Um. I explained to them what was going on in my case, you know, straight up, no bullshit. And they were like, all right, so you want to hang with us? You know, we got to protect our televisions, our our seating arrangements, this, that, whatever, our cells, and that's it. And we moved on. Junior, you know a lot of people are going to listen to this and they're going to say, there's no fucking way the Aryan Brotherhood was all right with him hanging around us. <laughs> yeah, but listen to this. You could you could answer the question like this: Aryan Brotherhood, Texas, is it was a low security prison. They're not even allowed to be in the low security prison. Do you understand? Right. So um, they were pretty much you could say uh, what do you, what, what do you say when when, when you take when you take. They want to get into this conversation, huh? Yeah, they do. Um, what do you call that? Uh, it's called dropout. If you drop yeah, out. Dropout, yeah. So you yeah. were in a dropout spot. I understand. That's, yeah, okay. that's what it was, a dropout. Fair enough. Okay, so that clarifies a lot. So yeah. when you say you weren't in wit deck, you were not in like – I was. They didn't, throw you, they didn't throw you in a regular prison and just let you do your thing. That, that's that – Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. No. So obviously I'm, people are, people are going to wonder, and I'm going to ask. If you don't want to answer, that's okay. Yeah. You were in a dropout with ABs. Right. A certain person who was high up in the Gambino family that's on YouTube, he's also said that at one point he was hanging around with ABs. Right. Were you hanging out with the same ABs that he was? Yeah. Okay. Did you meet him? Um did I meet him? I don't know how if I should say that or not, you know. Fair enough. You don't yeah. have to say anything. That's fine. Yeah. But you did know him from, like, you knew of his daughter, right? Yeah. You knew of them. What right. was your general thought about them? They were all right? Yeah, good people. 
Not bad. Okay. When did you get out of prison, Junior? Uh, 2020. And now your life is a lot different. A lot different. I'm moving to California as soon as I get off this fed shit. And you mentioned, I, I will kind of give a little background. I've talked to you for a while, right? We've been chatting back and forth. You had to do, you had a little case you're involved in, but you, you've told me and you just said on this that it's not a, it's nothing with this. This is a separate thing. Yeah. You're probably going to get past it, which is good. Um, I guess a few questions and then we'll kind of wrap it up. Hmm. I'm sure down the road we'll talk again, but do you regret your life decisions? Um, or were yeah. you just yeah. a product of your environment? Yeah, but you know, I have to say yes. I, I have to answer that in two parts. The first part, I would say um, no, because I drugged my mother and my sister out of the streets into uh, living less than animals. And then I regret it because I did so much time in prison. I've been shot. Uh, I've lost a lot of people. It's been a dreary life. I've seen a lot of bad things. You know, I have nightmares, you know. So um, that's a two-part question, you know. That's all I can say. You made a comment earlier that you admit that you cooperated. How can you get away from it. You're not making excuses, you said as well. Do you ever look back and just say, you know what, I did what I did. Did you ever think about saying, you know what, I'm just going to take what I get. This is the decisions I made. Do you ever regret doing that? Take what I get as far as what? Cooperating. Do you regret that? Do what? Oh, take what I get that at that time? Yeah. Like you, you mentioned like no, you were no. in the streets. I, I don't know. You're talking about when, when I did cooperate. Correct. No, because like I said, at that point was all my people were gone. Yeah. Everybody flipped upside down. Um, I had nobody out there. Everything's changed. Uh, these guys were looking to tell on me. I'm, I wanted the rest of my life. And I said, I said to myself, I'm going to, I'm going to be selfish. I'm going to be selfish. Let's just put it that way. I'll be straight honest with you. I'm going to be selfish. I'm going to take my life back. Where do you think you are 10 years from now? What do you want out of your life? You're not, a, want, you're not just, a young guy anymore. What what do you want out of your life? I'm 100. Of course I'm still young. Anyway, um what I want out of my life, I have a uh I'm getting married soon. I want to have another child. Uh I want to uh um, want to have another child, really. Yeah, I want to have another child. I I I want to um I'm getting into this business that uh, it's not too much, it's not too strenuous, and I'm going to build and save, and I'm going to live a normal life instead of, you know, like like when I first came home, I was disgusted. Oh, I got to go to work every day. I got to come home every day. I'm not like that anymore. Now I'm just, I'm going to live like a normal, normal person and see how it goes, and uh, I think I can do it. I think it's fine. Well, it's all about the people around you, and it seems like, from what I know about you, you have some good people around you, and, and that's important. Um, I'll end it with this because I find this interesting. Um, I talked to someone, and they told me they thought you were evil. What yeah. do you say to that? Uh, do you consider a, a person that kills people evil? Depends why they kill them, but. Well, that's your answer. That's the answer to your question. Do you think you can leave that life behind you? Oh, without a doubt. Good. Without a doubt. Now, um, don't don't try to hurt my family. Well, of course not. A anybody, see, that's where all the line is different, right? I think any, I'm not, I've never done, never been arrested, I've never done anything bad, but if you hurt my mom, I'll cut your fucking head off. You okay, know? so, so, so. I, I, I could answer that another way. I can say, uh, do I think I'm evil? Um, you um, used to be, maybe. No, no, no. I'm not evil because I never hurt a civilian. You understand? Whoever I hurt in life was always involved in the circle of the life that they chose. Like, you say that corny shit, live by the sword, die by the sword. Mm -hmm. That's what I lived by. And I never hurt. I never bullied. I never hurt anybody. I never shook anybody down. I never hurt anybody that was a legitimate person. So I don't think I'm evil. I think I'm more of a, of a protector than an evil person. 
obviously, this is the first time you've ever talked to anybody about this. And we've only been speaking for about an hour. This is the first time you've ever talked to anybody. Um, is this something you think you would do again? Do you want to tell your story to people? You mentioned one thing I've noticed that a lot of folks that were in that life do is they mention children. You don't want to see kids make the same mistakes you did. But is this something you want to keep doing? Do you want to tell your story? Is that your goal? There, there There's a lot to it. Like um, what I'm talking to you about right now, there is um, – it stretches so far because I am – I am in my 50s, and uh, I told you about uh, 5% of my life. You know what I mean? Um, if you want to continue, we could talk, and uh, you can see where we could go with it. And if you I'm, think sure, I'm sure that's something and, – and I was more just a general question. I'm sure we'll speak again. Um, I obviously know that we can't tell every single story in an hour or two. Right. I really just wanted to kind of bring you out of the shadow, break your silence just a little bit. I know a lot of the subject matter that has involved your life the past 15 years. We don't want you to talk bad about your ex-wife. That's not my goal here. I just want to kind of hear your story. But that is part of your story. Right. We right. saw your wife learn of what you did on that show. Right. Do you regret doing that show at all? Uh, Yeah, of course. Of course. You know, um. It, it, it was corny, number one. I still find it corny. I just – I was in a position where, you know, let me – they were offering me a certain amount, amount of money. Let me get this money. Try to get the best defense I can. Let me try to put as much money away as I can. I left, Renee, everything I had. I didn't take three cents with me. So wow. I just took whatever I could get, and I hit the road, and that was it. So, you know, I do regret it. But, looking back. But now, but now I can't because my life is different now. I'm going to ask you to tell me one final story, and I'll ask that you tell me the story about in prison with the old man, Rusty. You told me that story? Yes. Can you tell us that? Okay. Um, Rusty was in online. And you're talking about Rustelli in prison. Yes, he was Joe Messina's boss. Uh, he, he, He didn't talk to nobody. He spoke to me a little bit. He was a grumpy old man, but I really liked him a lot. Uh he cut this guy on a uh, this black dude on a, on a milk line, and the guy got disrespectful with him. They got into an argument back and forth. Rusty was a hundred; he thought he was fucking forty five, and you know he's ready to do whatever he's got to do. Um, Joe says to me, "What the fuck happened over there?" So I said to the guy, I "said What's your problem with the old man?" He goes, "Man, we'll talk about this shit later." I said, "Yeah, we're gonna talk about it later." So I said to Joe, "I says this guy had an issue with Rusty." He goes. Listen, do yourself a favor. Make your bones. That fucking guy disrespected him bad. So I went into the uh, the um, the weightlifting room, and I hit the guy over the head with a 10-pound plate while he was doing a bench press. And that was that. So you stuck up for the old man, Rusty Rostelli. Yeah. You were young then too, right? Yeah, like, like I was uh, 18, 19, yeah. Wow. All right, final question, then we'll get out of here. And I appreciate you coming on. I know – Again, you decided to just kind of come out of the shadows. So this is all very raw, basic. But Joe Messino died uh, in September of 2023. Um, Do you have anything to say about that? Um, He did the right thing by me. I I can't elaborate any further. So he helped you out in some way? Yes, in some way. He treated me like I was his child, yes. Yes. Why can't you elaborate? Because that's mine and his business, you know. Okay. Do you think you ever talk about that? Uh, no. You just take it to the the end. Yeah. Okay. Do you um, do you miss him? Do you miss that life at all? I love Joe. I love Joe. I loved the life with Joe. Um, and you knew him at his. At, you you didn't know the, the go bad Joe. You knew the. Larger than life, Joe. Let me tell you how close me and Joe were. He was my celly. And um, I used to clean the cell, but he put his fingerprint on the on the mirror one day. And I said, Joe, I clean the cell all the time. You keep putting your fingerprint on the cell, on the thing. He goes, and he kept ignoring me. One day I came in. I was in a bad mood. I says, Joe, what the fuck? I just cleaned the fucking mirror. What's wrong with you? I keep telling you, stop putting your fucking fingerprints on the, on the mirror. He tells the cop, he goes, 
this kid is a fucking maniac. He goes, you got to get him out of here. <laughs> this is how what type of relationship me and him had. You know? I, I've always heard a lot of good things about Joe Messino. He was a uh, obviously very large in that world, but I've always heard good things. He was a nice guy, supposedly. Um, he taught me a lot. He taught me a lot, you know. Um, you know, we'll talk about that another time, but yeah, yeah. So listen, Junior, um, again, I really appreciate you speaking to me. Um, I know we had kind of talked about doing it for a while. You definitely seem like a contrite individual. Um, you know, the, the people you're around, um, your, your future wife, very nice person. Uh, you've been very kind to me. And I appreciate you telling me just a little bit of your story. Um, I guess as we leave, what what do you – where will you be in five years? That's how we'll end this. Where will I be in five years? I hope happy living a, a life that I should have lived many, many, many years ago. Make up for lost time. Well, that's great. I think anybody can respect that. Yeah. Um, great. Um Let's hope we speak again soon. Maybe, maybe we'll see. Well, maybe we'll see you with a YouTube channel. You never know. Maybe you'll be the next great thing in the mob genre world. Maybe you'll be the next big star on here. Nah, if I'm gonna do anything, I'll do it with you. I'm not doing nothing. I'm not. You know. Well, maybe, may, maybe we will. We'll, we'll tease that. Um, yeah, we'll Junior. See. Yeah, we'll see how it is. Yeah, no problem. Listen, I appreciate you speaking to me. I really do. It means a lot. And uh, maybe we'll talk again soon. All right. All right. Take it easy. We'll see you next week. Okay.